are listening to the Black Don't Crack podcast. My name is Queen. And my name is Logic. Join us as we celebrate Black Canadian culture, resilience, and each other. Black Don't Crack. Yo, greetings. Bonjour. Wagwan. Yo, I had to borrow that from my brother, Quentin Vicetti, real quick, man. Big of Vicetti, man. But yo, welcome to the second episode where we celebrate various intersections of the black experience right here in Toronto. This episode, we have the privilege of interviewing an award-winning artist, writer, and curator, Anique Jordan. She has been working for over a decade at the crossroads of community, economic development, and art. Her work creates space to reinterpret the archives, offering a new and speculative version of the future. All this and more, so stick around. A bottle of lead, a gun in your jeans, and a little faith in me. A plane in the sky, the only starlight on this never ending street. The cameras in cops, we could have been stars on our mother's new screens. On our mother's new screens. All of these traps and all of these street signs, none of them will be yours or mine. But I'll be your empire. Just stay alive, stay alive, stay alive. These colors and flags, a sweat on your back, you're doing what you can. Pride on your head, a price on your head, you can never let them win. Just put down that bottle, tell me your sorrows, I care about you, fam. Yo, man, give thanks for that record right there. You just heard a hot 16 bars, man, from Regent Park's very own Mustafa the Poet. And that song was entitled, Stay Alive. You know, I got to give a special shout out, man, to um, to Mustafa for this, man. This is a very timely message, a very timely release. Um, he actually released a, a music video for this um, for this record. So I encourage everyone to go check it out and support that. You know, really giving some insight into like the state of affairs of our community, what's going on with our, our black youth, particularly black men um, right here in Toronto. But it also relates to, you know, the pandemic um, and just... The things that are happening globally, you know, a lot of people's lives are being disrupted. Um, a lot of people are fighting for their life, fighting for their health. You know, we're, we're living in, in times of like uncertainty. And um, I think it's always amazing when artists use their music as a tool for, for healing, to offer a glimmer of hope. So to hear the full version of Stay Alive, check the description for more information. And don't forget to follow Black Don't Crack T.O. Before our featured interview, we're going to hit you with some little known history with a quick black fact. Black don't crack. This is a quick black fact so that the presence of our people are documented and shown. Let the people know. This is a quick black fact. This is Casey B from Trauma to No More Drama. This is your quick black fact. Before there was Rosa Parks, there was Claudette Colvin, a 15 year old schoolgirl. On March 2nd, 1955, she refused to move to the back of the bus, nine months before Rosa Parks' stand that launched the Montgomery bus boycott. This was a quick black fact. Let the people know this is a quick black fact. Welcome to the Black Don't Crack podcast. Black Don't Crack. Who do we have on the line today? (laughs) Hi, hi guys, it's Anique. Um, Yeah. It's Anique. Hey, Anique. How are you doing, Anique? How are you doing? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Most definitely. And then yeah. for, for those who don't know, um, we know that you know, you're an artist and do all kinds of amazing things. Could you just let the peoples know a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah. So I am a, um, I grew up in Scarborough. I am an artist that practices in the city. Um, my work is primarily photo-based, um, performance and uh recently started working in sculpture beautiful i love it love it love it so can you tell us a little bit of how of how your journey began like your artistic journey Mm -hmm. um i think it started with me trying to figure out 
you know, how I can navigate the world in, and answer some of the big questions that I've had about the world, particularly growing up as like a black kid in Scarborough um, and trying to understand like the context surrounding my life. And, you know, the more, the, the as you grow up, like as, as us as like black people, when you're a kid, there's these moments where you're constantly like reminded that you're black and that there's something that is different about that according to um you know when you're looking at like this, these like more dominant narratives of of everything right. and so i think i was i was really trying to figure out ways to answer some of these big questions and the ways i had been going about it previously it was too they were too simple the answers were too simple it didn't allow for it to be complicated and messy and unanswerable mm -hmm. and i think um it was through like uh, working with art that I was able to find uh, the ways to like address those questions but leave the complexity within it beautiful, beautiful. amazing amazing now you, you mentioned that you um you know, grew up in, in Malvern, you know, I'm, I'm interested, shout out to all my Malvern peoples, you know, I'm, I'm interested, in, Malvern. <laughs> I'm interested in all how, like, Malvern has, I guess, like, you know, shapes your perception or that has influenced yeah. your works in any capacity? Mm -hmm. Well, so I grew up on the outskirts of Malvern, but I grew up in Dean Park, but it's kind of an area that, you know, once you leave Scarborough or like the east side of Toronto, people instantly, like, reference like you to being from Malvern or particularly with the proximity that I was to Malvern like I went that's where I did all the like community classes or whatever my dance classes in Malvern all my friends you know and so most of us who grew up in Dean Park just would claim Malvern as like the space that we were from because of how close it, it is mm -hmm. um, and so I mean I grew up doing a lot of community work as a youth as a youth leader or a community development person, like that was my interest. So I've always worked with young people, I've always worked within the community and that just never left me. Like even, um, even as I'm doing projects now, like my first uh, thing that I consider is young people and elders and particularly people who live on the outskirts of downtown Toronto because I think that there's less of an access to talk about art in particular ways um, because there's less art that's being produced and being, um, I shouldn't say produced, but being supported and being seen that ha happening right. on the outskirts. Right. So for me, I, um, I, I, I mean, it's not even a choice, it's just by default that's where I'm from, that's where all my friends grew up, like that's who I need to consider because I know that so many other institutions, most of the institutions only recently um, have shifted but, and only because it's become the sexy thing to think about like Scarborough or and not even yet really the West End, but to think about Scarborough as this new art space or whatever. Yeah. But I mean, for me, that's just, that's just how I function. Like I'm thinking about the people that taught me how to, how to be an artist. Can you tell us a little bit about your time um, in South America? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I lived in Ecuador for a year. Um, so I, my, background or like some of the work that I initially started up doing was in community economic development. Mm -hmm. My best friend and I had started a company in 2006, seven called Keys that supported young entrepreneurs across the city. Um, and that uh, led me towards doing community economic development, which is essentially looking at what resources are already embedded in communities, how people have been using that as tools for survival and how we can continue to leverage that and recognize those things. And so um, I lived in different places in South Africa and Barbados and eventually in Ecuador mm -hmm. um, doing this work. Um, in Ecuador, I worked for the um, Ministry of Culture uh, developing dance programs and um, thinking about um, and and using also the instrument called marimba and thinking about how uh like the like the dance that so i lived in ecuador but i lived in afro ecuadorian communities so i lived mm. primarily with black people That's right. incredible. but ecuador yeah. yeah ecuador and many places in south america are the racism is so um poignant that it's almost inescapable and it's 
so like you know um so thick mm -hmm. that it becomes a part of the fabric of how you move through the world right. even when you're it's not by choice so you know like you know like i couldn't call a cab without a white person being there to stop a cab a cab just would not stop for a black person at mm -hmm. all so um so living in the community i lived in is called esmeraldas and it was, it's a coastal community so there's a lot of uh tourists that would come through all the time on um on all of the big boats on cruise ships. And so I taught dance and I developed a, a dance curriculum that looked at how we can use dance as a form of economic development um, by leveraging the resources that would come from the cruise ships, but dance that was Afro-Caribbean and that was rooted in gestures and movements that come um, from, from Africa and from um, like different ways that we've been taught. So you've traveled like a few different places and experienced various things as a black woman traveling in these spaces. Yeah. What would you say um, are the similarities and maybe some of the differences in how blackness is perceived across the board? Oh, that's such an important and very, very, very good question. This, like, my entire undergrad was focused on realizing that the way that I understand blackness is purely linked to the geography that you live in. Mm. Blackness across different spaces is a completely different thing. And because of the way that we conceptualize blackness being brought up through the black uh, power movement, right. we understand, like, you know, if you don't say you're black and, and I and I visibly identify you as black, then you're, you're self-hating or you're mm. um, internally racist and all these different things. But that's such a spatial understanding of what blackness looks like. Right. And it also does not consider, it really doesn't consider all the different ways in which people have to understand themselves within the space they live in. It, it doesn't sure. think about class. Mm -hmm. It doesn't think about um, cultural specificity. It doesn't Tell think it. about language. It doesn't Tell think it. about shade. It doesn't think about many Tell things. It. And so, um, like, when I was living in Ecuador, many people didn't consider themselves black. There, there are people who do, but people didn't because of the immediate um, class um, uh, class connection that blackness is instantly associated with. And because of also, like, the pervasiveness of, like, the racism surrounded, like, being, being dark-skinned particularly. Right. And so... Like, even while I was there, like, and I have to recognize that I can't, I can't use my Canadian or North American eyes to be like, well, something's wrong with you or you mm -hmm. don't, you, you know, you're anti, you're anti-black or, you know, even as a black person, whatever. Like, I couldn't do that. I had to understand the context that I was living in and recognize how incredibly classed it is and what kind of repercussions it has for so many people. So people might consider themselves like, um... Like, I mean, they, people, most, for the most part, would say, like, Afro, Afro-Ecuadorian or um, Afro-descendant, some Afro-descendant, but, like, Ecuador is also a country where there's, like, a good percentage, I don't remember the number now, but let's say it's, like, 8% of the population is black, uh, the government never recognized that black people were part of the country for the longest time, yeah. like, to the point where the entire Ecuadorian soccer team is all black people. When Ecuador went to compete in FIFA, I can't remember the exact year, but that's something someone could look up if they're interested in the in the, 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 the exact details. Um, the, the FIFA officials actually went to Ecuador to verify that these people were from that country because wow. Ecuador doesn't claim black people and, you know, how racism functions, you know, they think black people don't exist in so many different places, whatever. And, but yet, you know, oh, that's my dog. He's losing it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. It, I mean, it took a long time for me to sort of understand that and I even forgot about those, um, about that until you guys asked me. Well, that's yeah. incredible feedback. Um, I know that you were like an artist resident at um, Osgood at the uh, University of Toronto. Now, can you uh, speak more about that? Because that's something we don't really, really hear too much. Yeah. Yeah. So it's an artist in resident at Osgood, which is at York University. Oh, York. The Osgood um, School, not the hall downtown. Oh, okay. So, um, 
Yeah, as an artist in residence there, it's, I, I'm going to just talk a little bit about this program because I think it's a great opportunity that a lot of people don't know about. Mm-hmm. Um, I think even in, I feel like May-ish, maybe later, maybe like summer months is when they put the posting out for people to apply. Actually, you know what? Let me not say. I don't remember. It's but okay. if you go on the, if you just Google Osgood Artist in Residence application or something like that, and it's a really basic application. It's just um, you provide a, a general budget and then a, um, a statement of of what you're interested in doing. What they ask for is somebody or work to be produced that looks at the past, the present, or the future of law in Canada. And so, um, and then you just apply. And it's an international residency, so anyone around the world can apply. Wow. Um, and then they also give you a budget to produce the work, and then they give you a budget to live off of while you're an artist in residence there. Mm-hmm. So um, my work was focused on the story of a woman named Clara Ford, who was a black woman that lived in Toronto in the Victorian era, Toronto, so like 18, uh, mid eight, late, later 1800s up until the 1910s. Um, and she, in 1894, was accused of murdering a wealthy white man from a family in downtown Toronto called the Westwoods. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, you know, this woman is like a serious G. Like, she just didn't take anything from anybody. They, mm-hmm. She was constantly harassed. She said that this man uh, had assaulted her. Um, she went on trial and was found not guilty. But while she, but she also used to wear men's clothing and walk around with a loaded revolver. And oh, while she was on trial, oh. she, <laughs> while she was on trial, well, in Toronto at that time, it wasn't illegal to have a gun. Mm. Um, but what they did do is if you were, and also Toronto was a very, like, um, it was called Toronto the Good during that, that period of time where there were very few murders that ever happened. Um, Toronto was led by this sort of moralistic um, Roman uh, sort of um, Roman Catholic sort of um, sentiment. So like the police would be enacting like the criminal code plus the Ten Commandments plus whatever else they wanted to do. And so the murder was the only murder of 1894 that happened in the city of Toronto. The only murder um, that was considered to be a premeditated murder. Um, and murder, the conviction of murder in Toronto at that time was by um, was death penalty, so you'd be hung, but they wouldn't hang a woman. That, that wasn't something that had never been done before. So, um, you know, she, it was just like such a phenomenal story. I think people should Google her name and read up about her. Her name's Clara Ford. Um, yeah, and there's a single book written about her, but a lot of Google, like, website pages. Okay, that's that's dope. Thank you for giving us some insight to some Toronto history. So we are now nearing the end of this interview. Short but sweet and packed with information. So we like to always leave things off with, you know, some sort of understanding or affirmation or coping skill that you use to deal with um, in in on a daily basis or when you're at heightened points of stress because I think it's important for us to continue as black Mm -hmm. people to or people of the African diaspora to continue to have conversations on mental health and how we cope with stress and be more public Mm -hmm. about those conversations Mm -hmm. so how do I cope with stress? any self care practices you want to share? Um, I do my nails (laughs) and I wash my hair and the, the biggest thing though is I probably do my nails whenever I'm very like my nails have been done all year I've been very stressed <laughs> whenever I'm stressed I go and do my nail and I do a color that I feel like I need to have closer in my life and um mm. and it helps <laughs> no it's good thank you thank you yeah, so no problem. much thanks you guys for having this this is great yes, thank, okay. thank you for blessing us we really appreciate you making time out of your busy busy schedule This black owned business is brought to you by buyblacks.com. Deeply dope teas create fashion statement pieces that celebrate and uplift black people and community. What's your statement? Let Deeply Dope Teas create and customize yours. For more information, follow Deeply Dope Teas on IG. And that's
that concludes our second episode. I just wanted to give everybody out there a quick shout out. I hope that you are taking care of yourself in this time of social isolation. Although we cannot reach out and touch somebody, make sure you reach out and contact somebody. Yeah, no doubt, man. I also want to take a moment to shout out all the students that we work with in various capacities, whether it's in schools or or other youth initiatives like our Black Youth Collaborative. Definitely got to big up our, our placement students from Centennial College, man, been holding us down. Definitely got to big up you know, St. Patrick's uh, Secondary School. All of our students are part of the responsibility program. Uh, Monsignor Fraser Midland Campus got to big up our students at Stephen Leacock Collegiate and also can't forget about Albert Campbell, man. Check in with all of your loved ones, people in your social circle. You know, make sure they're good and make sure that you are checking in with yourself and taking care of yourself. Self-care is so important. And shout out to Anit Jordan for such a prolific interview. Be sure to follow us on social media at Black Don't Crack TO on Instagram. This episode, we're going to leave you with a banger. Lethal Weapon by Wolf J. McFarlane. Until next time, family, peace. Black Don't, Black don't.